we got three jobs. That's the cheater. This is the one that you're supposed to do. I know. Actually, it's. this evening to come together to open our minds and hearts to your word to allow it to guide us to train us to enlighten us to all the things that are truly necessary to be those who overcome in this life we pray for wisdom and knowledge and the ability to remember what we learn we pray that we can recall it when we need it the most as the Lord himself did when he's faced with Satan to be able to say it is written we pray, Father, that not only do you give us this guidance, but the understanding of how much you have loved us and how much you have provided for us through Christ Jesus, our Savior and our King. We pray, Father, that we live in thanksgiving, being thankful always, being prayerful always, being joyful always, knowing that we have all these treasures that you have stored up for us in our service to you. We pray that you bless us as a Christian family, help us to love each other and elevate the needs of others above our own so that we can serve each other and submit to one another in fear of you. And we pray, Father, in doing such, the world can see you in us. We pray, Father, for the courage and the strength to preach and teach your word to all who ask. Pray, Father, to live in such a way as not to bring shame to what we share in the Word. We ask that you bless the sick, comfort them, those recovering from surgeries, those about to have surgeries, those who are advanced in years and long-term care. We pray that you bless them all, touch them, and comfort them. We give thanks for those that you have restored back to us, as always, being thankful for the blessings that you give us. Help us, Father, to not only see your wisdom in, in our study tonight, but to emulate the practices of those who have gone on before us to show us how to walk faithful, how to walk pleasing you in all that they said and did. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to start in Acts chapter 13, <coughs> pick up where we left off last week. But just as a refresher... Uh, the blank map that you should have, this map here, this map is for you, for you to draw on, for you to write on, for you to be able to, uh, at each location, not only uh, draw the line from there to the next place, but on the back of the map, as you see in the written instructions on the bottom, it's the job of the class in each location to write a summary of what takes place there. So that we can remember in the journey as we go each location, significance of the location, and begin to see the work of the Apostle Paul uh, in this first journey, which will continue into the second and into the third journey, etc. And see not only what he did, but the success of the gospel preached 
uh, to those that it was shared with, the uh, things that had to be overcome in order to share the truth, uh, all these things become pertinent. Now, we began Acts chapter 13, um, I believe it was a couple weeks ago now, we had a gospel meeting in here in between, I kind of lost track of time, but um, did you get maps and sheets? Okay, good. Uh, we began in chapter 13 in Antioch of Syria. Syria. Good. And why, why is it important to differentiate the Antiochs? Because there's a bunch of them. Good. We're going to find that out here just a little bit further in chapter 13. Uh, when we get to Pisidia, we're going to have another Antioch uh, involved in our study. But we began in Acts chapter 13 in Antioch of uh, Syria. <clears throat> And Paul and <coughs> sorry, Barnabas and Saul are selected out uh, by the Spirit and then laid hands on by the brethren, showing their approval in the situation uh, for the work that they're going to be sent to do. Uh, as I mentioned, when we get back in chapter 14, at the end of chapter 14, at the end of the journey, they are going to report back to the church in Antioch uh, the events of the entire journey to that congregation. This is the home congregation, if you will, for Saul and Barnabas. These are the ones who are going to initially send them out and support them in this work as they go. Um, with all that said, from Antioch, we go from there then to where? Who remembers? The Isle of Cyprus. Uh, not yet. We had to get a ship first, remember? We went down the navigable, 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 that was hard to say. navigable river to Seleucia. Seleucia is the seaport for Antioch. Uh, and whether they walked or went down the river is really irrelevant. They followed it down to Seleucia uh, where they picked up a ship. So the only thing on the back of your map for a summary of Seleucia is that's where they're going to have picked up the ship. To go now then to Cyprus as it was shared. Now when we go from Cyprus, we're going to go first to where in Cyprus? Salamis. Salamis, good. Uh, and Paul, as we discussed in great detail, uh, Paul is going to go into the synagogue. It's going to become his custom. Acts chapter 17, uh, I believe it's about verse 2. Uh, Luke even records that as Saul goes into the synagogue, it is his custom. Custom meaning that this is his practice in every city that he goes into with the synagogue. Because he supports the law of Moses, right? <coughs> No. What was the purpose of going in and, and having the custom of going into the synagogue first in the city? Audience. Okay. He had an audience. Okay. He would have an audience. Not only would he have an audience, but he would be, as it will be when we get to Antioch, he's actually going to be invited to speak in the synagogue. It was a custom of the Jews that when traveling Jews came from other places, at the end of their service, they would invite those traveling to come up and give a report of what's going on in the rest of the Jewish world. Well, Paul knew that he would be invited to speak. So as his custom was, he always began in the synagogue. Uh, what we also find out, as he concludes in the synagogue, when he goes outside the synagogue, who was always going to be waiting for him? Who is he the apostle of? <coughs> also to the Gentiles. They would be waiting for him. Word of mouth travels fast in these communities. And they would be waiting also for their turn to hear the word of God. Uh, that's going to be a real big deal when we get to Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, especially to be the first time that Paul's going to be run out of town by the Jews because of their envy or jealousy that he's not just sharing the gospel with them but also with the Gentiles. We'll see that when we get there. Okay, so in Salamis, uh, he preaches in the synagogues. Nothing else was reported by Luke as to the uh, success of the gospel, other than we know historically as we go, uh, Barnabas and John Mark are from Cyprus. They're going to go back to Cyprus at the end of Acts chapter 15. Uh, there are churches there. The gospel is going to have its effect both in Salamis and in Paphos that we go to next. So from Salamis, then we go to Paphos. Paphos is on the far western side of the island. 
and we go down and around the bottom of the island following the sea. Why? Mountains. <coughs> Cyprus is a mountainous uh, terrain. I think I actually have a slide for that. There we go. You can see the large mountain range here. Uh, this one here, it kind of cuts the island in half. You kind of have to follow the coast around to get to Paphos as we go. So we get to Paphos. Now here at Paphos is where we left off last week. Uh, they have come across the proconsul, the uh, Roman governor of the island of Cyprus. Uh, his name is Sergius Paulus, right? And Sergius Paulus is a a uh, man who is uh, wise, he's seeking knowledge, he wants to hear from uh, Barnabas and Saul. And right before they're going to be resisted by Elamus, uh, Luke is also going to share with us in what about uh, verse number 9, actually it's right after uh, Elamus the sorcerer uh, is going to try to resist them. Uh, Luke records now that it is Paul and Barnabas, or from now on he's going to be called Paul. And it's Saul who is also called Paul. Not a name changed, but the emphasis is going to be on his Greek name. And what does his Greek name mean? Small. Small or less, or becoming nothing, as in the Greek uh, illustrative style of language. Uh, and we understand that Paul, in his service to the Lord, uh, was willing to forsake everything that was who he was in order to give himself completely to Christ. Uh, and we see this now take the forefront and where in the list of the name of the two where it was Barnabas and Saul, now it's going to be Saul or Paul and Barnabas. Paul always being in the forefront of the listings from here on out. Um, but as they were going to speak to the proconsul, uh, we have Elamus, or Bar-Jesus, as he's also known. Uh, he is a sorcerer. He is a Jewish sorcerer. What was the problem with that? Against the law. Okay, it was against the law. Uh, against what law? Jewish law. The law of Moses. And what was God's feelings about that? We shared that last week, or week before last. Uh, going back to Deuteronomy, what was God's feelings about these Practices surrounding sorcery, divination, Stone. soothsaying, stone them. Stone them. God, God considered them to be an abomination. Uh, such practices as were related specifically around idolatry. And how did he want Israel to think about idolatry? You shall have no other gods, no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20. Uh, he said, I am a jealous God. What was Israel's problem for the majority of their history? Was it not the flirtation with the idols that were around them and the kingdoms that were around them that served these idols? Yes. Uh, in much the same way as Paul would tell Christians in the first century that in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5, that idolatry is covetousness. What's covetousness? <coughs> What's covetousness? Desiring. I want, I need, I like, give it to me. Yeah, somebody else has. What up? Somebody else has. I want it. Uh, and can we be guilty of idolatry then today? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So we must be on guard of the same things. And uh, if, idolatry, if idolatry is covetousness and it is the things that are around us that others have that we then desire, is it not the same as having the nations around us that we then desire to be like? It's, it's the same practice, isn't it? Over and over again. That's why we must be on guard against the things of, of this world, uh, the things that glitter, the things that sparkle, the things that cause us to forget whom we serve. And in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, uh, the statement by the Apostle Paul to the brethren in Colossae is, if then we have been raised with him, he says, look what direction? Upward. Upward, symbolic of where God should be in our lives. Always before us always above us, and we should be looking to him. It is a practice that uh, Paul shared with the Colossian brethren that they should uh, go back and remember their original uh, resurrection with Christ. If you have been raised with him, which is a subject he already dealt with in chapter 2, when he talked about we were raised with Christ in baptism, 
Go back to your early roots and remember why you became a child of God in Christ Jesus. And then never forget to look up. Then he goes on in the next three verses and tells them, uh, in every sense or every tense of our service to the Lord, from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 4, where we have our beginning, which is looking back, he says, our present is to be wrapped up in Christ. The concept of being wrapped up as Christ, or cloaked with Christ, if you will, is not that we are to separate ourselves from the world completely as if we don't belong to it, but to be so wrapped up in Christ that we begin to look like who? Like Him. That we are involved in everything He teaches, that His mind rules our lives, that all the things He gives us uh, helps us to always overcome the things around us that they have no power over us. Uh, then he says for us to then think about our hope. Our hope is our future. And never lose sight of all the things that God has provided for us from beginning <coughs> to end to help us be motivated to overcome the things of this world. Paul would tell Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when talking about the issue of Godliness as a form of gain. He talked about men seeing godliness as a form of gain. He said that godliness with contentment is great gain. What does godliness with contentment mean? Satisfied with what you got. And, and the things that you must have, not the things that you want. Right? Does God bless us with the things that we must have? I look down, I'm not missing too many meals. Most all of us work with our hands, are able to work with our hands, are able to support one another, provide for one another as brethren, and so forth. But it is the heavenly things that he provides us that give us great, I, I always love the language, great gain. If you were an investment counselor, and you're trying to help someone understand how to, to produce in their lives so that they have a future, that word great gain would be something that they would want to hear, right? Paul says, godliness with contentment is great gain. That's an investment worth having, Dan. If by our service to God, we have less than those around us, we should be thankful for our poverty. Absolutely. And uh, be content like the Apostle Paul was in everything that he did, he was content. And he did not have great affluence like uh, some of the people around him. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, and by the way, this is the correct context for Philippians chapter 4. We all love the, the passage, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Well, that's on the end of that Paul, no matter what state he found himself in, whether he had ample or he had nothing. He could serve the Lord because Christ gave him the strength and the word to do that. Had nothing to do with the way it's being used in the world today where a fellow's going to go out and build him a new garage. Oh, I can do all things with Christ strengthens me. That's not what he was talking about. It's not what I can do. It's simply what I can learn that God has given me that gives me all the tools necessary to serve him. And no matter what state I find myself, poor or wealthy, everything necessary to serve him is given. And that should be our mindset going forward. Good. All right. So, uh, Elamus, who's had Sergius Paulus's ear all this time, is going to resist Paul uh, from sharing the truth with Sergius Paulus. Now, we already know that this is a Jew, a sorcerer, who has already shown that he has no care for the laws of God that he claimed that he should be serving God under. Um, but Paul's going to make sure that we understand his heart. If you look real quick at um, verse 10, uh, as Paul looks intently at uh, Elamus, he says, O full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Now that, beyond a shadow of a doubt, with the spirit that God was provided through the Apostle Paul has relegated for our understanding the true nature of this man. Is he interested in God's will at all? No. 
And these terms that are used here are powerful uh, in terms of describing the true nature of his heart. Uh, nothing that I ever want to be associated with my name. And I hope that we appreciate that. So in John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus was speaking to his own people. And earlier, earlier before we get to verse 44, he said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And when they heard that term, set us free, they went at Jesus, well, we, we're not slaves to anyone. Now, first of all, that was a lie, wasn't it? They've been a ruled nation going all the way back to Babylon, haven't they? And they have never been independent of anyone. Uh, but in the case that Jesus was talking, the freedom he was talking about was freedom from something that separated them from God in a worse way. Freedom from what? Sin. Sin. And the truth would set them free from that. But yet, in this, in this situation, uh, they would come at him. They would talk about the fact that uh, he couldn't be any part of Abraham and so forth. And Jesus is finally going to say, if you really really understand Abraham, you would listen to me. He spoke of me. But he said, you can't hear because you are of your father, the devil. Now, do we really believe when he said that, that, that he would say that they were born literally with, with the devil as their, their biological father? No. 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 That term, son of me, <coughs> characteristics of. Okay. Now, uh, bar Jesus, that's the son of Jesus uh, as was Elias's uh, Jewish name. But at the same time, it also met the characteristics of his father. In the same way we have the term in John chapter 17, uh, Jesus used concerning Judas, he called him son of perdition. It wasn't that he was literally, his father was destruction, but he was of the character of destruction uh, in that he killed himself before he repented. Uh, was a description Jesus used to describe Judas. But it means the characteristics of. Now he says he, that he's the son of the devil or the characteristics of the devil. The devil, according to Jesus in John 8, 44, was a murderer and a liar and the father of all such. So what does that tell you about this character of this man? Not That's not good. So uh, we, we cannot even for a moment uh, believe that Paul is acting... Uh, inappropriately towards this individual. He's earned everything he's about to receive. Now, uh, in the segment that we finished reading last week, uh, just real quick, um, verse 11, uh, it says, And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall uh, be blind, not seeing the sun at the time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So the proconsul believed, and he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now we're going to spend some time with that, but isn't it an interesting turn of events that this man who sought to lead the proconsul is now having to be led around? Kind of quite a quite a turn of events, isn't it? Uh, he's been brought low uh, by the power of the apostle Paul. Um, it's stated here, emphatically in the very last verse, verse 12. But the proconsul believed when he had seen the things done, uh, being astonished then at the teaching of the Lord. That word teaching, didache in the Greek, uh, means the doctrine of the Lord. Doctrine meaning what is taught that comes from whom. What does Luke record that he's given credit to? God. To the Lord. Now Paul did the preaching. He was the, the human vehicle. But the preaching was done. But what made the words known that they were from God? What was the purpose of miracles? To confirm the word. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Was there a miracle associated with the very first gospel sermon? Yes. Yes. And it was for the purpose of? Convincing. Convincing those Jews that this message that they were listening to was from who? God. God. Now we get down to verse 36 in the conclusion this Jesus whom you have crucified is now both Lord and Christ. And when they heard that, not, 
No longer when they saw that, when they heard that, they were what? Touch of their hearts and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Sergius Paulus is seeing the same thing. Being convinced of what he's seen, what's happened now to Elamus, he is convinced that the word that's just been preached to him, that's been shared to him by Paul, is from who? <coughs> from the Lord. And it states emphatically that he believed. He believed. Now, what is unique about this is Luke's not going to tell us any more of the events that transpired here. But we should know just some facts about this in history. Is that Sergius Paulus, shortly after Paul leaves and after his stint in uh, Cyprus is over, he's never going to be heard of again in the history of Rome. Now, why do you suppose that might be? Became a Christian. Became a, Christian. Became a child of God in Christ Jesus. And how wonderfully receptive were the Romans to that? <laughs> okay. So. Uh, there does seem to be some pretty strong historical evidence that this went on to be uh, a purposeful meeting for him and his heart and his service to the Lord. Uh, with all that said, we're shared here the, the results. Uh, and once again, it proves the point of everything that God shared uh, through the apostles in Mark chapter 16, verse 20, that they would confirm the word by signs and wonders, but it would always be the word. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, the gospel preached. God chose that methodology to save men. Uh, and we're going to get a good look at the gospel preached here when we get to Antioch um, of the city. Um, okay, so let's move on. We, we did hand out the next one, right? Okay. And I think they he used a very powerful person when he... Uh, did this to this uh, saucer because these saucers from what we've seen in the Bible could do things that were amazing to the people and to have somebody like that have this happen to him when there's nothing absolutely he could do to stop it absolutely with this power he had have we already seen this by the way what Rick's bringing up how many remember back to Acts chapter 8 when the gospel came to Samaria? There was a sorcerer there too, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. Right? And he obeyed the gospel. Uh, but remember, before he obeyed the gospel, he was someone renowned among them, having amazed them at the things he done. But once he saw the miracles performed by Philip, he said, no more of this nonsense. I'm going to follow in that. He could tell the difference between what was sleight of hand, what was uh, obviously fooling the people, and then the true power of God. Once again, we have that shown here as well. The sorcerer who had the pro council's ear all this time uh, might have done a trick or two, but the difference was obviously seen uh, by Sergius Paulus. And the effect allowed his ears to open and his heart absorbed the message. Perfect. Good comment, too, by the way. All right. Um, Let's see. <coughs> so, let's talk about Paphos as a summary. So, on the back of your sheet, uh, you should have already drawn the line from uh, Salamis to Paphos. But on the back of your sheet, you should have a summary of Paphos. Uh, Paul and Barnabas came across Sergius Paulus. Uh, going to preach to him, they were stood against by Elamus. Elamus was struck by him blind if I get my mouth to work right and the pro council believed the gospel okay uh, that should just be a quick summary on the back of your map concerning Paphos did you get to that uh, Barnabas and Saul Barnabas? we did that the last class so I didn't spend a lot of time with that I didn't hear it about the name switching, you mean? Yeah, well, him being thought to be an apostle, he was... Oh, no, we haven't got to that yet. No, we haven't. Okay. We're not going to do that until we get to Lystra in chapter 14. Okay. Yeah. Because that term doesn't get used till then. Okay. Okay. All right, let's see here. All right, let's move on. Um, everybody understands how to do the quick summaries. Just take four or five of the bullet points that were important, write them on the back concerning that city, and then we're ready to move on. Okay, so next week, by the time we get ready to do uh, the review up to where we are so far, somebody should be able to run us from 
uh, Antioch of Syria all the way through Papas, what's transpired in each city. And we will look for volunteers. Okay, so with that under our belt, let's move on to the <coughs> next segment. And of course, it's not going to advance either, is it? No. Um, John's in one of these classes real close, so I'm going to go fetch him up so we can move on. And while he's doing that, let's, uh, let's go ahead and do some reading real quick. Let's take a look at verse uh, 13. Do you know how to move it forward? Or make it move forward? Let's go ahead and read while they're figuring this out. Uh, verse 13 of uh, chapter 13 says, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, There we go. We're good. Thank you. Uh, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. All right. So as we get ready to take a look at this, let's quickly look at the geography real fast. Pamphylia is the Roman, a small Roman province. Um, you should be able to see on your maps here. It's, uh, thanks, Doug. Um, anyways, of course, anything but the TV. So, um, this little area right there. Did you see it? I couldn't see it. Yeah, oh, it right. I can't see it at all. Okay, it won't work on the TV. It won't work on the TV. Yeah. Well, all right. At any rate, uh, it's that small area there. By the way, all of Asia Minor is under Roman control, which means it's been broken up into provinces. Why did they? Why did Rome was? Why was Rome so big on this uh, province segment uh, to each of these areas they control? Taxes. Set. Somebody said it. Taxes. Taxes. It's absolutely right. It's the easiest way to segment the population into tax paying areas uh, and then to get them together to collect when the time came uh, at the end of crops, at the uh, end of whatever merchant uh, season it might be, to have them come together and pay their taxes. <coughs> Do we see this in um, Judea? Yeah, they had to come together uh, regularly to their uh, home headquarters, if you will, to pay taxes, to be registered. Registered means you not only were a census taken of you, but that census was for paying what? Taxes. Good. So all these little areas are broken down into provinces or states like ours, if you will. Um, but uh, Pamphylia is this bottom one here, uh, and they come to the chief city, Perga, um, which is uh, down at the bottom by the ocean, and there's an inlet river. And actually, I think I have one more map here. There it is, right there. This gives you a little idea of the terrain. You see uh, coming into Pamphylia, this little province in the bottom, Kirk is on this eastern side. Italia, we're on our way out, is going to be on this western side of the same inlet, this low-lying area that allows from the harbors there merchandise to come in land. Uh, and they're going to come in from this side, they're going to come out from the uh, far west side at the end of the journey. So it gives you a little bit of idea of the terrain that they're dealing with uh, going in. Now something happens here in the first verse when they arrive here that we need to talk about for just a minute. 
John Mark. Now, John Mark has been with them since they left Antioch of Syria. Uh, he has traveled with them. Luke records that he's going to travel with them as their assistant. But as they come here to Pergo, John Mark is going to turn around and go back to Jerusalem. Okay. Now, Luke does not share with us here why that is. But if you go to Acts chapter 15, at the end of Acts chapter 15, when Paul sets it in his mind that he wants to go back to the congregations that he established on the first journey, speaking to Barnabas, Barnabas says, great, but I want to take John Mark. Paul says, nope. Not only does he say no, there's a, a quite a little uh, disagreement between the two of them about it. So much so that Barnabas and John Mark are just going to leave and go to Cyprus. And Paul's going to take Silas and he's going to go instead. Now we're never told exactly what the problem was between them. And rest assured that later in the service, especially to the Apostle Paul, uh, whether it's Colossians chapter 4 or 2 Timothy chapter 4, we learn that John Mark becomes very profitable in his service not only to the Lord, but even to Paul. Uh, we also learn in 1 Peter chapter 5 that John Mark becomes to Peter like Timothy was to Paul, like a son in the faith, and he, Peter even mentions him in that light. So whatever the reason is, that John Mark has left here. And there are many who speculate, by the way. But the scriptures left it blank for a reason, and we don't need to speculate. But Paul didn't want him to go anymore. So there was something contentious there uh, at this early moment in his service. But he would mature in Christ, and whatever it was, obviously they got by. Uh, remember in Philippians chapter 4, he tells the brethren in Philippi to take Eodia and Sintish. He says, you brethren who are spiritual, help these two sisters get along. Well, how could he say that if he couldn't get along with brethren and work through issues? We see that Paul would, would practice what he preaches. And he would learn to re-establish kinships in the Lord, uh, serve in the faith, and become strong in the Lord. It's an interesting thing that he brings that out in the scripture because people have the wrong idea thinking Christians back then got along. But nowadays... We don't, and that's, that's not right. Absolutely. But I, I, I do appreciate, and I hope we should too, that the first century Christians, they may not have had moments where they always got along. Obviously, by Philippians chapter 4, that was the case there in Philippi between the two ladies. doesn't tell us why. He just tells them, you who are spiritual, help them. Help them get over whatever's cause them to be against each other. But in that, he never said, run off and go to another group, did he? He put the onus on the brethren to serve one another, to submit to one another, and to provide for one another what was necessary to be unified in Christ above themselves. That takes place here, together, in love. Considering ourselves in that moment, as Galatians teaches in chapter 6, when we help erring brethren, we're to consider them as we would want to be considered in the same place. We would want somebody to come put me back on the right path. I hope. Right? But when we act in love towards one another, when we share what's most important with the Lord's purposes above ourselves, the unity that's so important to the health of the body of Christ is achievable. But we have to seek His will in it. Listen, there's a couple of things in this become important to all of us. And I am going to chase this rabbit real quick. It's a terrible practice that we, members of the body of Christ, and I'm, I'm just as guilty as a man. We're supposed to let go of our pride and all this kind of stuff. But when, when we become sick or in need or bad things happen, we withdraw. We kind of suck it in. Well, it's mine to take care of. Why did God give me this family? If he didn't want this family to help me, if he didn't want me to be able to go, by the way, James chapter 5 says, confess your sins to one another. 
And it's not even that it has to be a sin. It can be a weakness, a moment where I need some help. I can go to Mike and Mike, I'm struggling with this. Mike can see, Dave, you know what? I did too back, back to this time. Here's what I did. These things are important. There's a reason that God gave us this family. There's a reason that he put us in a body of Christ to work and labor. You hear the term? Work and labor together? If you're going to plow a field, it's much easier to do it all bunch of you than you all by yourself, isn't it? We're going to mow grass here pretty soon. It's better to do it as a team, isn't it? What pride may have nothing to do with it? Well, it is absolutely what it is. But what I'm trying to hope you get to is this. First, don't be so prideful that you withdraw. God wants you to come and receive the help you need so that he can regain your heart and give you the strength to overcome. But he put us in a family for that reason. And the second thing is, don't quit. Don't run off. You're part of this family. You have made yourself a member of this family. You have put yourself in subjection to shepherds of this family. Don't run away. If you can't, if you can't come to a solution because you don't get what you want, listen to the words. What you want. What about what God wants? For, for you and for all of us. Learn to listen to the voices that are talking to you. Don't let them cause you to exit stage left, to withdraw into those ugly holes where you're all alone and you're left to deal with this thing running between your ears, which is the worst possible thing that you could spend time with. Because in those dark moments with Mrs. Control, everybody hates me, nobody likes me, think I'll go eat worms after the song goes. But we build as low as me, don't we? We go see brethren, brethren lift us back up. They might tell us things that are hard and things we need to hear, but they lift us back up, don't they? Listen, those are two important rules for learning to serve. These Christians, they were commanded to do these things together and told to help each other. But God knew that not all personalities would mesh. But one thing he did say is we can love everyone. Absolutely. And it's why he emphasizes it so much in my opinion. So there's a passage I want you to write down. It's easy to memorize. It won't take much at all. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1 down to verse 21, are the, what we call the three walks. Paul tells us to walk in love, uh, walk in light, and walk in wisdom. Okay? This is how we walk, how we live. And this is all through the Word of God. But in verse 21, he says, the key to making it all work in your life is submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's the whole memory verse. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Going back to what we were talking about, pride. If I submit to my brethren, I become small. Their help becomes important. The Lord's purpose is become, you start to see how the fix takes care of itself. And like I said, if, even if I have to hear the hard things, I need to hear them. We get, the, like chips the, off, we get the chip off our shoulder. I like the word selfish instead of pride. Absolutely. So that's when a lot of problems in marriage. We become selfish. It's what I want. Very good. That's perfect. Sounds like you were in marriage class and everything. <laughs> Which <Okay>. one? <laughs> the Lord's. That's important. All right. So I, I chased that rabbit. I, I didn't mean to go, but these are important things for us to hear. And we can't have a Bible class where we talk about the importance of these things. We're, we're missing the boat. So I don't mind chasing those kind of rabbits. All right. So let's bring it back now on topic uh, before that last ding dong goes. Okay, we talked about John Mark. Uh, it's in your notes, Colossians chapter 4, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, the restoration would take place. They would become uh, profitable to each other. Uh, so our summary of Perga is real easy. It's just the landing point into Asia Minor. They're just going to come to that area, if you will. Uh, nothing else is shared with us other than John Mark leaves. And you might make a note that John Mark leaves in Virgo. 
Any questions up to this point so far? Okay. Um, verse 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And that was the second. And you know, I have to stop because we don't have much time to get in there now. So we're going to have to move. We'll pick up here next week, Lord willing.